Hey guys. Uh, hi. Um, I'm Fahed, uh, the co-president of the Cannabis Club, the Berkeley Cannabis Industry Club. Um, we're really excited to welcome you guys to the inaugural She Can event. Um, this has been a long time coming. We've been working on this for over a year now, and we're really, really excited. We're really excited also that the, shun the sun is shining on us today, <laughs> finally, after a couple of weeks of rain. Um, so we decided to put on She Can because we wanted to highlight the importance of having equitable representation in this industry. And that's kind of what brought us to today. Um, we wanted to highlight a couple of things. First, this is the first zero waste educational building in the country. Um, so that being said, any plastic, any non-compostable or recyclable items, please take out of the building with you or give it to one of us in black shirts and we'll figure it out. Um, the other thing is, is it took us, it was really hard to get this club um, accepted in this university. So please don't vape or smoke or anything that'll put us at jeopardy. It's really difficult. Um, and the last thing is, uh, bathrooms are to the back and to the left. And we're gonna have Q&A stands on the sides of the seats. So if you have a question at the end of the panel, please uh, line up over here. The last thing is um, I wanted to introduce our partners for the event and they're Miss Grass. Miss Grass is a brand that shares the same ethos that the Berkeley Cannabis Industry Club has and their mission is to make cannabis accessible. And with that, I wanna throw it to them to get the schedule and to get you situated with the day. And we're really excited to introduce them. So Kate and Anna, please, uh, welcome. Hi, everyone. We're so excited to be here and thank you guys so much for showing up. My name is Kate Miller. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Miss Grass along with Anna. Um, as Fahed said, Miss Grass is a modern cannabis brand with a mission to make cannabis accessible as well as to equip consumers with the resources they need to be conscious cannabis consumers. Hi guys, I'm Anna Duckworth. I'm the co-founder and chief content officer at Miss Grass. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Am I, do I need to I lean over? Um, so look, I mean, I'm just gonna step away from this. You guys know what's happening in the cannabis industry right now. We're at a critical moment. Apparently, yes. Um, we're at a critical moment in this industry where we actually have a lot of power to shape the way it looks in the future. Um, when was the last time we had that opportunity, you know, to really build an industry from the ground up, at least as it exists in a legal market? Um, so, you know, I think today the important thing for this is to make sure that everybody comes together, that we share information, we share experiences, we band together, we leave here today holding hands, knowing exactly what we want it to look like in the future. And as Fahed said, that means equitable representation, it means that it means environmental sustainability, it means public health is at the front of the conversation, um, and it means that we all are working to pull something together that we are proud of. Um, so as Kate mentioned, you know, we're all about building this roadmap for conscious consumerism. We're so grateful that you guys are excited about that mission too. And we want to thank our sponsors. Actually, no. First we want to thank <laughs> Incubator and Success Centers SF for being our charitable organizations today. So all proceeds from the event are going to those organizations. Success Centers SF actually has a full cannabis track now. Um, and that's really, really exciting. So we want to congratulate them on that. And we do also want to thank our sponsors because this would not be possible without you guys. So thank you, Ease. Thank you, Pax. Thank you, Kiva. Thank you, Garden Society and Aster Farms. So let's kick it off. Thanks for being here. Did Fahed talk about the bathroom? Yeah, he did. Okay, cool. <laughs> Have fun in there.
Good afternoon. Is this on? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Andrea Lovato. I am the SVP of Legal and Compliance at Ease. Um, I'm especially excited to be here because I'm a Berkeley alum. Um, as an undergrad, I can say that I dabbled in cannabis, um, but I never truly thought that I would make a career of it um, or have it be a professional pursuit. And seeing, you know, almost 20 years later where we are as a cannabis industry, it's pretty incredible. Um, I'm also incredibly excited to introduce our, um, our panelists today who are from a really wide array of policy and legal backgrounds, and I'm really excited to talk with them today about the first year of legal cannabis in California. Um, so um, first we have on the end uh, Rodney Holcomb. Rodney is a staff attorney with the Drug Policy Alliance. In his role there, he drafts legislation and amicus briefs and engages in policy adv advocacy and public education in support of drug law reform across the United States. Um, in addition, he has uh, co-drafted model social equity ordinances that localities may utilize when considering efforts to create a more equitable industry. Um, next, we have Aunt Jane. <laughs> Next, we have James Anthony. Um, James is a principal of Anthony Law, a law Group, um, a CCIA board, uh, board of Directors member, and um, a founding director of the Hood Incubator. Uh, James leads the Anthony Law Group and is a longtime cannabis activist, lawyer, and political strategist who specializes in California cannabis law, permitting, land use, business strategy, and local government. Since 2006, James has worked exclusively in cannabis law and policy and consulting, focusing on the California local government issues. <laughs> Next, we have Shabna Malik, a partner at Brand and Branch LLP. Um, she focuses on um, intellectual property and helping, helping cannabis companies with their intellectual property portfolios as they, across, as they expand across state and international borders. Uh, she's also the, um, uh, one of the founders of the National Cannabis Bar Association, which is now the International Cannabis Bar Association. Uh, she also co-founded the Bay Area chapter of, the, of Women Grow in 2014. And last but, but absolutely not least is Graciela Castillo-Grings. Uh, Graciela is, uh, works with Sacramento Advocates as a lobbyist and before that has spent more than 15 years in public service in California government, uh, most recently as the Deputy Legislative Affairs Secretary to Governor Jerry Brown. During her time serving in the Brown administration, Graciela negotiated and um, advised Governor Brown on more than 800 bills and very importantly, oversaw the regulatory implement implementation of legislation uh, relating to the um, medicinal and adult use cannabis. Uh, so had a very, very important role in that. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the panelists. So I wanna just start out by talking about this first year of adult use in California. On a scale of one to 10, how well would you say it's going and why? basic. Are there negative numbers? No. Yeah. 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 Uh, a scale of one to ten. How well is it going? I don't know. Five. What do you think? Five? Five? Something. I, you know, five, maybe six. Five plus. Um, it's a really hard thing to do. And finding the sweet spot where the cost of regulatory compliance and the tax burden on the above ground industry doesn't uh, price it out of being able to compete with the, we have, I don't know if anybody's heard this in California, there's rather a robust underground cannabis industry. <laughs> um, and it's still there. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, Milton Friedman had it right when he told uh, Richard Nixon that the war on drugs is not gonna work because you cannot repeal the law of supply and demand. And that's where we are today. I'd venture to go even lower than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, as we know, so many people of color and women just simply don't have access to this industry, and for a number of reasons. Uh, they don't have the networks. They don't have access to capital. Uh, there are just so many burdens and barriers in place that just make it uh, so prohibitive. Um, so I think, you know, in years to come, we certainly want to encourage uh, folks to enter this space. We want to provide them with the resources. But right now, um, they simply don't exist in the way that they should. Here, here. Well, I guess I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I would say also about a five. And part of the issue is the regulations, Prop 64, everything really comes out of a balancing act between what's politically feasible and what's actually happening on the ground. I think if you actually see the numbers for Prop 64 in, in where California is, a lot of the times the public can be, in California, more, much more progressive than our elected. And, and a lot of the times when you see the conversation happening in Sacramento, you end up realizing, sorry, you end up realizing that there's still a lot of stigma around cannabis. And that stigma then ends up influencing public policy. And if we were talking about strawberries or any other commodity, you would not have the over, I think it's now 600, 700 pages of regulations when you read them all combined. You would not have that. However, because you still have the stigma and fear, it ends up influencing some of this uh, policy. And unfortunately, the people that end up getting impacted the most are the people that are raising their hand and saying, I want to come into a legal marketplace, regulate me and tax me. So I would say a five plus we also need to bring in the local cities to do their part. But that's another conversation. Well, I agree with everybody here. Um, I think that what happened, what we saw happen at the industry level was uh, a lot of our clients were small legacy um, uh, cannabis company operators and a lot of them, maybe the majority of them were not able to survive the transition and it was really a shame. Um, the ones that did survive are doing okay. They've had to take substantial investment. Some of them have had to take on partners um, and they were surviving for a while and then the new, well the proposed and now uh, final regulations came in and then that created a whole other sweep and the industry is really struggling with that so I agree we're, we're really the companies that have been around the legacy California companies are really struggling to survive um, and I totally agree that we don't see the same kind of access we Amanda and I often talk about um, who makes up our clients? Who are the executives that are our clients? Who are the lawyers that are now joining our clients? Are they women? Are they people of color? And by and large, no, they're, they're not. Um, and so we're still looking for that. We're looking for that diversity among the executives and the stakeholders at the industry level. And legalization didn't really bring that um, to bear, at least not yet. Yeah, so you touched on a great point. Um, as you know, a lot of us are concerned about today is adding more diversity, adding more women, more people of color to the cannabis industry, especially in leadership roles. What are some things that we can do um, you know, as industry members, as um, lawmakers, as regulators? Um, what, what are some things we can ask of our local and state government to increase um, women and people of color in the cannabis industry? I think first and foremost, fund their businesses. Uh, so give them the startup capital that they need. I think in addition to that, we need to change uh, federal banking restrictions. We need to make it uh, to where folks aren't unable to get loans uh, to start their businesses. We need to create credit unions at the state level. Uh, so many of those things need to happen. I mean. You can see movement across the state, of course, in Oakland, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Los Angeles. There are social equity programs uh, that give uh, some benefit to people who've been harmed by the drug war. Uh, so they'll give them technical assistance. They'll give them um, priority licensing. They'll give them licensing fee waivers. But I mean, they still need hundreds of thousands of dollars to really break into this industry and do it in the right way. And unfortunately, restrictions are making it so, so difficult for them to really even start their businesses. So I think probably capital is probably, for me, the starting point. Oh, dear. Um, <clears throat> yeah, all of that. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars is on the low side. If, if you don't have $2 million like to just play a little high-risk gambling with, uh, I'm not sure that cannabis is for you. And um, I have always spent a lot of time talking people out of the cannabis industry, even 10 years ago when it was all medical, when there was all kinds of risks associated. And, you know, a lot of those risks are still there. Um, incarceration, property forfeiture, 
Let's hear it for the Supreme Court going 9-0, that civil forfeiture is not a thing under the U.S. Constitution. Um, that was last week. Look that case up. But, you know, the, the word hasn't quite trickled down. Um, there used to be a time when I would warn my clients about losing custody of their children. Uh, so all of that is still out there. And, of course, we live in a world, again, you may have heard, of differential enforcement uh, based on a number of factors, including race and class. Um, so... I, I don't know. I, I, I think the policy work that's being done is great. I would really like to see a consumer movement demanding some um, social responsibility on the part of the people you buy your weed from because you have choices. I mean, I, I think it's, I'm not sure I even know the answer. I think that's a terrific approach, actually. I, it's funny, I was just talking to my sister, who's also an attorney. She works for a company. And I was talking to her about um, the process they go through in retaining outside counsel. And her team is all women, and the general counsel of the company is a woman, and it's a huge uh, multinational company. And she was telling me that when they were going the last round of requests for proposals that they did, looking for outside counsel for a special project, all the decision makers were women. And they prioritized the diversity of outside counsel, the corporate responsibility of outside counsel, the way outside counsel promoted from within, and how many um, women and women of color they had at the management levels. And the takeaway was that in, unless you have decision makers in those positions, women as decision makers, people of color as decision makers, I don't actually know how you create change. That, that is how you create change. When you have a group of women at a company deciding who's outside counsel, they get to say no to the big law firms that are only pr promoting white men, which is all big law firms. Um, so that's, that's what you need, is you need um, that kind of diversity of representation at decision-making, wealth-owning levels. And I don't know how we get there. That is 100% correct. I mean, I've been in government, and even though government can be a little more diverse, when you're in areas or you're having a conversation and meetings and trying to decide policy, and you don't have people of color or people with just different perspectives to bring to the table, you're not going to get that representation in government either. And so one of the things that has been, social equity programs have been really important in having that conversation. I would also say making sure that there are point people at the local government level and the state government that can actually help some of the equity applicants move through the process. These are complicated issues, they're complicated. There's a lot of hurdles that you have to navigate. And if somebody can help people that are not normally calling all these departments and dealing with tax agencies and dealing basically with about six regulatory bodies in California at the state level. That's just at the state level alone. It would make it much easier for people to navigate the system. And actually to James's point, it, the consumers can, can demand things of companies and demand corporate responsibility and social responsibility. And then all of us can within our positions. And you sort of have to put yourself out there. So as outside counsel, Amanda and I, as a woman on law firm, can demand that we see that same reflection in companies that we work with. We know companies can often demand that in the supply chain. You know, don't buy your milk from someone who's abusing their cows. You know, make corporately responsible decisions and, and create a um, trickle effect from that. Great, yeah. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what a consumer type of movement would look like. How would one mobilize that? How would one start that? What, how, how would the consumers get a voice? <laughs> so the, the <clears throat> I don't know what I did to this, is it working? Um, so what's interesting is at the moment, there are a lot of good nonprofits um, working on, on different issues. So certainly um, CCIA, but CCIA is a trade association, right? It does not represent consumers. Um, Hood Incubator, some other uh, Supernova, other uh, social equity nonprofits uh, have that particular focus. Um, so kind of some consumer representation, but not the specific focus, uh, so California normal is, is one possibility, but you know, California normal is basically a small kind of, I don't know, maybe two person operation and uh, 
we need that. We, we need a consumer's union for cannabis users. Perhaps California Normal can grow into that. Americans for Safe Access for many, many years did that for medical cannabis patients in California and across the nation. Uh, and a lot of their focus now is in Washington, D.C. So uh, their voice is not as prominent as it was. Uh, so, you know, somebody wants to start a nonprofit, think about that, or go talk to California Normal and see if they'd like a little help organizing. Awesome. So I want to switch gears for a moment and talk a little bit about another point that you all touched on a little earlier, which is the illicit market. Um, this is something that is undercutting the ability of, you know, anyone, including uh, women and people of color who want to create um, legally sustainable businesses. How do we fight the illicit market? I, mean, I know this is a big question, but I'd really like to just start to think about how do we how do we really, you know, steer people towards legal cannabis, um, especially when the taxes are so high? <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> so, actually, one of the issues that is happening again, talking about stigma, there's still a, so there's. I, I'm trying to say over 40 pieces of legislation just introduced alone this year in Sacramento. And part of the reason, again, and this has been the conversation that I was having with the legislature in my previous role, where it's, it's like, guys, well, I'm sorry, we're trying to regulate the people that we already know about. Is that clear? Because that's what we're doing. And so for, let me give you an example. There's a piece of legislation right now that is going through, and this has been a big fight in Sacramento, where, as we're calling it, equal access and delivery. Under, the, under Prop 64 and the regulations reaffirm this, that anybody who is licensed at the city level and can also license at the state can basically deliver statewide. And the reason for that is there's a lot of localities, over 60 localities that are not actually doing anything or are banning. And so when you talk about the illegal marketplace, if regulators aren't doing their part to make it easy for the businesses to come into a regulated marketplace, then we are not doing our job either. So what I would like to see is some activism from this group and basically voicing your opinion and showing your hand and saying to Sacramento, hey, I'm a small business and I'm being impacted by this legislation. Because talking about how you basically create more of a groundswell, that's how. And kind of the thing is getting involved in some of the discussions that are happening right now because these conversations are impacting the businesses and sometimes there is a disconnect between the policy that is happening in Sacramento and how it actually impacts people on the ground. So that would be my advice. It seems so obvious now that you said it. <laughs> yes, what she said. Yeah, I think we have to continue to focus on creating social equity programs. We have to continue providing those resources. I mean, and reducing the barriers to entry. I mean, beyond just capital, just the process is just so confusing and so complex. And for someone who is less skilled or less resourced, uh, they're going to have a really, really hard time navigating this really complex space. So I think just reducing those barriers generally will be a huge help. Uh, but of course, enforcement. Uh, People have a lot of different positions on that. I think rather than just spending tons of money on enforcement, we need to be spending those resources to actually provide um, opportunities for folks to enter this space. So, you know, provide those opportunities and then perhaps if you want to enforce after it, go forward. But provide opportunity and from there perhaps we will see more diversity in the industry. We will see more people coming above board uh, and we'll see a better marketplace here in California. Awesome. Um, oh, oh um, I, I don't know how much I have to add to all of that. But I, I will say that it's pretty clear to me, having done this for 14 years, and you know, I grew up in Hawaii, uh, and I moved to California in the 80s. And so I have watched the drug war do its thing, uh, which is it has made drugs more available than ever, and cheaper than ever, and purer than ever. So hey, uh, go drugs, go. Um, <laughs> the enforcement mindset is a trap. It is a trap, and it is a trap because, you know, I don't blame them. Law enforcement is an agency like any other agency. Bureaucratic agencies need funding. They get funding when they have something to do. So there are law enforcement agencies that need something to do, and, and you know, everything is a nail to them, and they've got a hammer. They think that they're going to arrest their way out of this problem when we have 40 years of history to the contrary. So really, um, whatever Band-Aids, but it's 
The, the brutal economics have to be addressed first. The cost of compliance and the taxes have to come down. Uh, cost of compliance comes down by simplifying regulations. It is not uranium. We do not need 429 or 629. How many pages of administrative regulations we have? We just don't need them. Yeah, you touch on a great point. Um, you know, I've, I've myself sifted through those 500 pages of regulations many, many times. Um, if there were one, two, three items in those regulations that you could change um, in California, what, what would be those, what would be those, those items? I would, I mean, I think every lawyer in here knows I would change 5032B right off the bat. Like, are we nuts? What was that? And I actually, to your point, I was on a panel a couple years ago, and at that time, it was, it was, there, there were some pending regs, and I remember there were something like 14 pending regs that all address like child safety concerns. Like, get a grip, you know. And I'm a mom, and even I'm like, for God's sakes, what do you think is going on at home with weed? And it's just like, do you mind clarifying yeah. 5032B for the, oh, the folks right. that aren't that so, haven't memorized the regulations? Yeah, exactly. Do I have it memorized? A commercial, no uh, licensee may only do commercial, engage in commercial cannabis business with another licensee. So. It's created ambiguity, it's like people are screaming, the sky is falling, it's horrible. Um, it's basically, as the shorthand is that it's um, uh, undermining the opportunity for brand owners, or as we like to say, legacy operators who weren't able to uh, buy their way into the Mokursa licensing system. It's preventing them from partnering with a license holder to produce safe and uh, reliable product because they might not be a um, Muckers licensee. We don't know exactly what doing commercial cannabis uh, business might be. We don't know whether a couple of other um, regulatory fixes actually fix the problem. We don't even know what the goal of the regulators was in doing this. The uh, policy bases that they issue along with proposed regulations answered no questions. Um, and even between the proposal phase and the final phase, they eliminated some language that was meant to clarify, but in doing that, they further muddied the waters. So it's, I mean, entire businesses are being underdone because of this regulation and the ambiguity it's created. I want to know what you have to say about it. <laughs> it it's hard to know where to begin because the the, the whole premise of the regulations is that this activity has to be tightly controlled and the ownership needs to be um, really sort of rigidly identified. And, and so, so I've learned a lot about how uh, business and finance works in the last couple of years. It's not where I started. I was a land use attorney, problem property prosecutor. Uh, kind of a social activist. Uh, it's great when your social movement has cash flow. That really helps. Um, but, you know, th there are some things that capitalism does extremely well if you let it. And one of the things is it can produce an amazing amount of um, innovation. And let me assure you, the cannabis market today is considerably less innovative than it was three years ago. Uh, it can bring um, commodity to market efficiently at good prices with um, good um, customer service and convenience. It is r much less so than it was three years ago. Uh, and you know, it can bring in money. Because if we're going to bring in money for um, social equity businesses or any other businesses, we we need to be able to find ways to you know, accumulate capital and put it to work. There is plenty of money on the planet, right? Like it's, it's a weird thing. I never do this. Rich people do not know what to do with all their money. It is like a serious, they pay people huge amounts of money to like, can you figure out what to do with this money? Um, and at the, here. at the moment, what they have to do is they have to take it to Canada because Canada has real legalization at the national level, which is something we don't have. So therefore, Therefore, they have a stock market that you can run money through. They have a banking system that you can put the money in, right? They've got all this cool stuff that we don't have. So, um, 
you know, I, I don't know. And and you know, the, the last thing I want to say about the the underground market is that really until cannabis is legalized coast to coast and until the cost of compliance and the taxes come down, there will continue to be an underground market, and it probably needs to be legalized globally. Because I think if you're drinking, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're smoking really good cannabis in Mexico City now, I think it probably came from California. <laughs> Great. Well, that is a great segue into my final question because we are getting close to the Q&A. Um, odds on federal legalization. When do you think it's going to happen? Pop quiz. Dice. Yeah. yeah, so don't all, don't all jump at once. I'd venture to say sometime in the next four to five years. I mean, we're seeing public support um, at its highest ever. We're seeing more Republican support of this than ever. Uh, but I do worry that it won't happen in maybe the way that we need it to. Perhaps they'll just give states the right to do this. Um, and that's, you know, fine. Perhaps they'll remove it from, from remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. But I mean, I'm most concerned about repairing the harms of the drug war, ensuring that folks with prior convictions have an opportunity to clear their records. Those things are crucial. Uh, providing funding to communities so that they can be rebuilt after being ravaged by the drug war. And until that sort of thing happens, um, I'm not really sure what legalization looks like at the federal level. But I think by 2020, we'll see the passage of some, 2022, we'd see the passage of some okay. legislation. I'm a little more pessimistic, I would say about a decade. And just the reality is in California, we are, tend to be much pro more progressive. But if you look at other states and kind of where they are, they're not quite as friendly to cannabis in itself. Now, so I think I would say maybe a decade, but maybe that's being optimistic just because I'm not very hopeful right now at what is happening at, our federal, at the federal level and in, in our government. So that's just me, though. I think that federal legalization is a bit of a red herring, and it's very much what Rodney's saying. I, I, I mean, maybe, sure, in four or five years, but I think it's more important how uh, the manner in which cannabis is rescheduled or descheduled, and then what the directive is, if any, on how the states must or may behave, um, and how the federal government must or may behave. And that's sort of what's important, is what comes next. Um, we saw this, obviously, in, in any state level legalization, and even with um, the farm bill happening. It's uh, a stroke of a pen doesn't solve really anything at all. It becomes a starting point, and, and then then you see problems or solutions um, fall out. Okay, I, I'm going to pitch for the the radical long shots. So I think we get something before the next presidential election, right? Which is less than two years. And and I don't know what that is. Maybe it's the, the states, you know, do whatever act, or maybe it's the, okay, we'll fix the banking and the taxes. You know, that would go a long way <coughs> to towards helping get things moving. Uh, and, and I think there's a, a couple of scenarios for this. Um, and one that I think is extremely unlikely is I do not think we get um, the equivalent of the Marriage Equality Act at the Supreme Court. So that's too bad. I mean, I wish some brilliant high paid lawyer, not me, would figure out how to swing five votes on this court and go make it happen. Uh, but I'm not holding my breath on that one. What I do feel pretty strongly about is that <clears throat> The gentleman who occupies the presidency of the United States is not stupid and he knows how to campaign. And the Democrats have blown this issue for decades, right? And it's no longer theirs. They don't have the ball anymore. So every single Democratic candidate now for president, if you ask them, will be all about legalizing cannabis or letting the states do whatever they want to do. But it's up to the president to make the move, right? Now, if we had a, a Republican Congress, I think he could have whatever he wanted. On the other hand, I think the Democrats are going to be hard pressed to vote against some kind of uh, cannabis liberalization um, initiative that comes from the White House. And I think he will steal their thunder on that, and that will leave, you know, a significant amount of campaign energy and money that could have gone very strongly for an, an alternative uh, to the current president. It might just stay home, and that, that's a problem for us, and so I think we need to not be distracted by that. But, but it is true that you know the, the right does the work of the left and vice versa, and so uh, we could see something rather dramatic, and meanwhile, the country is still going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> well put.
on that note, um, I want to open up uh, the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, we have about five or ten minutes for questions for the panelists. Uh, if you could go up to the, there are microphones on the side, I believe. Oh, there should be. I wanted to, to jump on the thread because it's very exciting to me. Hi, I'm Jessica, um, and I am in cannabis, and I am actually slightly scared of federal legalization because um, as I've been fundraising and talking to people who've been in cannabis for a long time, um, it sounds like the big players, the Coca-Colas, Monsanto, um, Anheuser-Busch, are already very closely watching what's going on, and I'm curious as we've seen sweeps of small businesses not make it through regulation. Um, your thoughts on will there be another sweep after federal legalization with these big players basically coming in and commoditizing something and pushing people out um, simply because they can't keep up with that level of technology pricing efficiency and that much capital? I, I think you have the farm bill to thank for what's going to happen, which is that mainstream businesses are going to be dizzy with hemp-derived CBD for, like, the next decade. And I can't imagine they might they would have the resources or interests to go into actual marijuana, but maybe. Um, but what we see right now is that everyone and their mother is turning to hemp and looking at hemp and creating hemp products, in particular, hemp-derived CBD. So that could prove to be pretty distracting for big companies. Yeah, I'm not especially optimistic, but I mean, I think it would be great to have carve-outs for smaller manufacturers and smaller uh, license holders so that they can have a piece of this industry, perhaps even before larger operators are able to even enter it. So I think, I don't know how, I mean, it's certainly progressive and it may not actually um, have teeth um, when you... You know, put this to test, but I, I mean, I'd really like to see um, some emphasis on just licensing those folks first um, and then giving the opportunity to larger folks. Oh, it's working now. Okay, sweet. Um, so I had a couple things. Uh, after state localization, it caused sort of like a checkerboard in the state. So that was one thing that wasn't mentioned, like all localities kind of have a decision whether or not they want to open a dispensary or give a small business permit or whatever it is. So I definitely would encourage you to follow your own city, um, lo um, like city scale of rules. And if any of them are coming up with like public comment opportunities to go for that. Um, I did a public comment to um, on a statewide scale to New Jersey and it was about like something about vaporization and they were like, thanks for that. You were like one of five comments and we're gonna go ahead and pass it. So people aren't really getting involved and like they're actually really, the people in government don't know about cannabis and they really need like people to like us to tell them what to do. Um, that was one thing. Uh, the second thing is Berkeley is coming up with an equity ordinance, so look out for that. And my question is, um, uh, you mentioned the, the models of basically the hurdles that a lot of small businesses have, sorry James, um, to entering this business, and do you have any creative ideas for raising capital, like beyond sort of like the system that we are in, which is like going after million, you know, millionaires and people like that beholden to shareholders? Like, is there a way that the community can come together and raise capital for each other and for ourselves? So, th this question comes up, and it makes me really, really nervous because well-meaning people will pop up with, we'll just mortgage grandma's house, or we'll get you know everybody in the family and every in the everybody in the community to contribute. And you know this is an extremely volatile and high-risk business. And I think by the time the state straightens out the cost of regulatory compliance and the burdensome excessive taxation. Uh, it'll be a couple of years, and left standing will be companies that had millions of dollars to just burn through. I mean, I don't see a lot of them making money right now. And so, uh, you know, I really encourage people to think twice about that. But, it, you know, it, in terms of coming up with other people's money in some kind of creative model, I, I just, I don't see anything. I mean, the, Oakland did a good job of getting... Um, cannabis general applicants, the non-social equity applicants to pay the rent 
of the, the social equity applicants the, who are um, by definition 80% um, of area median income and had either uh, spent 10 years in a high arrest uh, uh, police beat, which is the third of the city, which is the flatlands, um, or had been convicted of a cannabis crime. So, I mean, they got their rent paid, but they didn't get any money. Um, and if, if you do that, if you require more and more contribution from entering businesses, then what you do is you polarize the industry, right? So you've got equity businesses, by definition, quite poor, and then you've got businesses who can just write off paying their rent and giving them a loan, and everything in the middle, and Oakland had an incredibly diverse ecosystem of small kind of mom and pop businesses and just amazing stuff that's gone. It's not in Oakland, it's probably underground, and, you know, so the, the unintended consequences are always unpleasant. And um, I just, I, I don't know, I don't understand why cannabis is supposed to fix 500 years of racism in the United States. I mean, we will do our little bit. But, you know, it is a heavy lift. So I'm, I'm sorry. I feel terrible. <laughs> No, I'm not offended. I just think that it's like there's got to be other ways to get off the ground. Like, why are we working in this system? Like, this is our opportunity to change it. But I mean, it's certainly not the most successful thing ever. But I mean, a lot of jurisdictions are setting aside tax revenue or um, revenue generated from taxation to give grants and no interest loans to folks operating in this space. I know Portland just gave out two um, grants to folks who are operating in the space to African American men. So I think, you know, that's a start. Um, certainly $500,000 isn't enough um, for an entire city filled with folks who are equity qualifying, but I think it's a start. And so we just have to continue pushing that envelope. One of the other things that I was just thinking about is how legislation has actually changed um, in California to allow small breweries to actually compete against some of the big conglomerates. Mm -hmm. And the reality is you take some of the, you basically California prides itself with ba having lots of small breweries and kind of being the capital. And part of that is because they've looked back and decided that a lot of the legislation, a lot of the statutes are too burdensome for small businesses. And so I think Hopefully, in a couple of years, we can re and that's the problem. I'm talking a couple of years because everybody is giving the conversation in Sacramento. Everybody's still like, we must regulate. And it's like, oh. So the problem is, if it be in a couple of years, I'm hoping people understand that this is just another business, like any other business. And if we can actually understand that and understand the challenges, and that not all of, you know, if you have 10 million and you're investing in California, well, great, you can actually afford some of the regulations. If you don't have that kind of capital, you're not gonna make it, unfortunately. And so that's kind of the conversation we really need to have. We wanna have that diversity of voices in California and the diversity in our business community. That's what we need. But unfortunately, I, I'm not confident that this year we're gonna be able to actually be that open-minded. So we have time for one more question. Uh, you wanna go ahead? Thank you so much. Um, I would really love to hear your opinion about where we're going with the true medical use of cannabis. Like, what is happening? Will I one day be able to have the very expensive medicine that I take because I don't want opioids in my system? Will that ever be covered by my insurance? And second, and what could I do about that? And secondly, um, is there, could, could you tell me, is there anything happening for people who are institutionalized and have medical issues to have access to CBD. Will I go to jail if I give my mother a transdermal CBD patch in her nursing home so that she doesn't have to be out of her mind on opioids? This is a really, really important subject that I think our whole country needs to look at, opioid addiction and what CBD could do. And I would, I would love to know what you guys have to say about that. That's a really complex question. Um, access is certainly important, but I mean, yeah, I just don't have that answer. I mean, as an attorney, really, can, you, can anyone legally tell me if I administer CBD to my mother, is that legal or illegal right now? I don't know. Is she in California? She's in California. And she's in a licensed nursing home? Yes. Uh, I think if you check the health and safety code, they used to be designated caregivers, but of course it's up to them, and a lot of them receive federal funding, and so they were shy about doing it. Um, 
you know, the, the medical use of cannabis continues to be a huge and pressing issue. And what, what shocked me, I don't know, eight or nine years ago when I figured this out is that the medical use of cannabis is actually much, much larger than the, the so-called recreational or, or adult use market because people, we all get old, right? <clears throat> if we're lucky. Uh, and you get old, you get arthritis. If you wake up in the morning and you're in pain, that's good. That means you're alive and you need a little something for that. <laughs> and opioids are obviously problematic. So I, I do think, and this is why I'm really happy that Americans for Safe Access is focusing in Washington and continues to be a viable organization because that's where we need to push. I mean, we are facing right now the irony that MDMA and psilocybin are going to be Schedule Two or Three before cannabis, right? Because the research is possible, and and that's outrageous. So, I'm. Although you know, you might also think about in terms of long shot changes in our culture. Um, if the medicalization of psilocybin and MDMA somehow then leads to the naturalization of the use of psychedelics in our culture and we develop a culture of facilitated psychedelic experience, that could be a radical game changer. Might take a generation, but it's an interesting possibility. And, and I'm so sorry for your grandmother. And you know, I don't know, it's, it's California. Um, it, it's probably going to depend on the, um, on the caregiver, the, um, the, the care home. Uh, but it's not impossible. I mean, that's what California's law is for, and we still have medical cannabis in California. What if the grandmother was taken off of the facility and just like taken off of the facility? What if she went and picked her grandmother up, took her for a drive, gave her what she needed, dropped her back off? <laughs> Thank everyone for coming today and for your really thoughtful responses and, um, op and opining on the cannabis uh, culture we live in. So thank you. Well, thank you for the amazing panel. Um, if you have any more questions, you will find them around, grab them, ask them a question. Um, 